Hey folks, good to be back in front of the whiteboard. Haven't done one of these whiteboard lessons in a while. In today's Wrath of Math lesson, we'll be proving that an ideal of a ring with an identity is a proper ideal if and only if it contains no units from the ring. This is a viewer requested video. I always appreciate those viewer requests, so be sure to leave yours down in the comments. This one was requested by Diego Math Magician in a recent live stream, so I hope you'll subscribe so you don't miss the next live show you can come by ask your math questions live get them answered or pushed off to a future video like this one quickly before we jump into the proof let's make sure we're clear on a couple definitions by proper ideal we mean an ideal that is not equal to the ring some definitions of proper ideal are a little bit different that's what we're talking about though a proper ideal of a ring is an ideal not equal to the ring also we're saying a ring with identity to specify that we're talking about rings with multiplicative identities. Some definitions don't require rings to have multiplicative identities. We're talking about rings that do have multiplicative identities. So this is a biconditional proof. First direction we're going to prove is that if an ideal of a ring with an identity is a proper ideal, then it has no units. Remember that a unit is just an element with a multiplicative inverse. So in order to do that proof, we'll do the contrapositive instead. Remember that's an equivalent statement, so we can prove either one. The contrapositive of if an ideal is proper, then it has no units. The contrapositive would be if the ideal does have a unit, then it's not proper, which means it's equal to the ring. So that's what we'll prove for this first direction. The second direction is basically instant, super, super quick. So this first direction is re really all we have to worry about. So we're going to say that I is an ideal of the ring R, just so we have names for the things we're talking about here. I is an ideal of the ring R, and remember R has a multiplicative identity. We're going to call that multiplicative identity 1, of course. So remember, for this direction of the proof, using a contrapositive, we're assuming that the ideal does have a unit. So let's specify that now. Let's say, let u, some element of the ideal, let u in the ideal be a unit of the ring R. So u is in the ideal, and it is a unit of our ring R, meaning that it has a multiplicative inverse, which is going to come in handy. So let's just specify this means that there exists u inverse, an element u inverse in the ring, in the ring R. This is what being a unit means. It means that there's this inverse element in the ring such that, which I'll abbreviate ST, such that u inverse combined with u is equal to u combined with u inverse. The, uh, the order doesn't matter for inverses and of course their product is equal to the multiplicative identity 1. Now, why is this super useful when we're talking about an ideal? Well, remember, we say that ideals absorb multiplication. So if we take an element from the ideal, like u, for example, and combine it with any element from the ring, like u inverse, for example, the product also has to be in the ideal. u inverse times u has to be in i. You might be familiar with left ideals and right ideals. Uh, in this case, it doesn't matter if we're talking about a left ideal or a right ideal or a two-sided ideal because inverses commute. So it's going to be the same thing whether it's u inverse on the left or u inverse on the right. So that doesn't matter for this particular proof. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about with left and right ideals, then you probably don't have to worry about it. But of course, I encourage you to look it up if you are curious. So we know that u inverse times u is in the ideal. Now, of course, that means that 1 is in the ideal because that's what u inverse times u is. So 1, this is supposed to be an arrow, by the way, pretty bad arrow. 1, the multiplicative identity, is in the ideal. And you probably see where this is going. This means we can combine any element of the ring with 1, and that product must be in the ideal. And so let's go through that a little more slowly. And let me change colors as well because this purple is fading. All right, we'll go with blue. So additionally, but again, using the definition of ideal, for every element of the ring, which we'll just say little r, for every little r in the ring r, 
If we combine R with any element of the ideal, that product must also be in the ideal. Let's just say we combine it with one, which we know is in the ideal. So for every element R in the ring, R times one, since one is in the ideal, R times one must also be an element of the ideal. Again, the order of R times one doesn't matter because the multiplicative identity commutes. R times one, one times R, it's the same thing. So again, it doesn't matter if this is a left ideal or a right ideal or a two-sided ideal, proof works just fine. What's R times one? Well, of course, by definition of multiplicative identity, that's just R. So this means for every element R in the ring, R times one, since one is in the ideal, R times one is also in the ideal, R times one is R, so this means that R is in the ideal. Then, by definition of ideal of a ring, we already know that I is a subset of R. We just showed that R is a subset of I, because every element of R is an element of I, thus, by definition of set equality, we have that the ideal I is equal to the ring R which means that I is not a proper ideal because it's equal to the ring, not a proper ideal. So we just showed if I contains a unit, then it is not a proper ideal. Thus, if it is a proper ideal, it can't possibly contain a unit. That completes the proof of the first direction. Let's go to the next direction, which is a breeze. Now for the next direction, in order to complete the proof, we need to show that if an ideal has no units, then it is a proper ideal. In this case, I think it's really clear we should use the contrapositive because that gives us a really strong assumption. The contrapositive of if it has no units, then it's a proper ideal. The contrapositive of that is if it's not a proper ideal, then it does have at least one unit. As in, if the ideal is equal to the ring, not a proper ideal, if it's equal to the ring, then it has at least one unit. Now that's a ton of information to start with, if the ideal is equal to the ring. So let's do that, let's use the contrapositive. So we can assume that the ideal I is equal to the ring and we're practically done. Do you see what the last step is? We want to show that the ideal being equal to the ring forces the ideal to have a unit. Since the ring has a multiplicative identity and i is equal to the ring, this means the multiplicative identity one is an element of our ideal, and that's it. Because what do we know about one? Well, it is a unit, because by definition, it is its own multiplicative inverse, since it's the multiplicative identity. So that's it. We've just shown that if i is not a proper ideal and is thus equal to the ring, then it must have at least one unit. So if it has no units, then it is going to have to be a proper ideal. And that's it. That completes the proof. Again, we just proved that an ideal of a ring with a multiplicative identity is a proper ideal if and only if it has no units of the ring. That's it. So I hope this video helped you understand this fun little proof about ideals and rings. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, need anything clarified, or have any other video requests. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time, and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math lessons on the internet. I could have had more success if I retired my romancing. I could have had more love.